Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for turning out on this horrible sort of day and evening. Um, the We Brave Few. We happen to have around about nine or ten people on Zoom this evening, which is great. Um, we kept sort of figures up on Zoom. We weren't sure whether it would work or not, but seems to be. So um, there. I know there's Eric and Sylvia from the other side of Farringdon. Um, so you wouldn't expect them to come this evening, but um, they, they're always very good. Um, anyway, uh, this evening we have two talks. Um, one is by the women of Noden Orborn with Liz. Uh, Jan was going to do a second talk. Unfortunately, she's ill. So, yes. Yes. <laughs> and um, luckily, we had a very exciting donation to the to the Heritage Centre, and uh, John will be talking about that in the second after after Liz has spoken about this. Um, and it is very exciting indeed that we've been given these things. And the person who's given them, I thought we thought was going to come this evening, but no, she's, she's not here. Country. Country. She's, she's in London. Oh, she won't be here tonight then. Can't. Um, just a couple of uh, things I want to say about. Uh, one is on the 17th of December, which will be our next um, monthly meet, we will be in the, in the Memorial Hall. And it's a bit different from our normal talk. And in fact, even from our normal Christmas extravaganzas we uh, we get on with. Um, we will be asking the whole of the village come by during it's a Sunday afternoon from two to five o'clock uh, in drips and drops, hopefully. And we will be asking them if they'd like to bring old photographs, uh, obviously relating to Orborn and artifacts, anything they have that they would like us to scan. We would love to scan anything that's still out there we haven't got already. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we won't take hold of them, they'll, they'll have them back straight away, but we will have them for our records and we'll obviously ask them if we can use them um, for our own purposes uh, in the centre. So that's great. Um, that's the 17th of December. Next year, uh, we've got another dig. Um, Operation Nightingale thinks it's so important here, they want to do another dig. And you'll remember this year, Time Team turned up and announced, no, they weren't announced, of course they weren't, but um, they did, they filmed the whole thing. And Tony Robinson, Sir Tony, uh, he voiced over a, an hour and a half program, which uh, went out all over the world on YouTube, and they had over a million, million. First month, they've had a million yes. viewers. Yeah. And, and that's the biggest they'd ever had. Yeah. And um, it's not uh, been unnoticed. Um, you know, we have a link with the World War II Museum in America. They knew that it happened. And um, can I tell them about our cabinet? <laughs> We're all in this together, of course. We are. Um, we've been told in no uncertain terms that um, a lot of our artifacts that have been dug up have to be placed in a hermetically sealed cabinet, an airproof cabinet, because otherwise they deteriorate. And, and we have actually seen this happening just a little bit. Um, so we're going to uh, purchase, uh, we're not sure in what form it will be, some sort of cabinet. We're going to have a move around the Heritage Centre. And um, it's going to cost us seven or eight thousand pounds, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the World War II Museum have told us every time they send a coach load, they will donate a further £150 to us. So that's nice, isn't it? Mm. That's sort of 10 coaches be £1,500. It's more than 10 coaches. Actually, next year we've got popped in. I think it's 11 or 12 at the moment. Um, anyway, that, that's uh, an exciting project for next year, but we've got to do it as soon as we can. And so we will be raising funds somehow or other very shortly. Um, I'd like to hand you to Liz now because we have also got this year into next year. It's our 10th year. How about that, everybody? 10th anniversary. Liz just wants to tell you a bit about uh, something we've got planned for next year. What we've got planned for next year is that we want to celebrate our 10th anniversary. Yeah. <laughs> I've written a song about 
I know. <laughs> but we don't, we're not sure how we're going to do it yet. So um, we've got lot, lots of ideas about how we want to. I mean, one of the things we'd like to do is to celebrate where we've come from, you know, that horrible journey word, because we've got so many new displays. We've done so many things over the last 10 years. We've got um, the fact that we've collaborated with the um, museum in America who come regularly now, and it's very much part of their itinerary, um, how we cope during the pandemic, how we uh, relate with the school and work with them, which I think is um, is great, is amazing. Um, and all the new artifacts and photographs we've got, I don't know about more than 10,000 photos have been scanned. So you know, somehow we need to celebrate all of those different aspects of what we've done over the last 10 years. And whether we do that by um, a huge display in the Memorial Hall, I don't know. If anybody has any ideas about how you think we should celebrate this, you know, get in touch, let us know. Um, the talks is something else we never, no, never intended to put on monthly talks when we started. That was just something that came up in one of our first committee meetings. Well, you know, if we want to be spreading the history of the village and researching it, why don't we do monthly talks? And they've been incredibly popular, you know, and, and I think that's a lovely part of us all getting together and being part of the community. Um, so there's lots of things, lots of ideas we have, but we just need to really work out how we're going to do it. We're probably not going to do it till July, because first of all, we've got to get the new centre sorted, but to find out where to put the new cabinet, how much of a reshuffle we're going to have to have. Um, we'll obviously be putting something in the Heritage Centre about our previous 10 years somewhere, because I think that needs to be celebrated in the Heritage Centre as well. Um, but also we need to put on some kind of different activities as well. And um, we don't, we're not quite sure how that how that's going to look, what, that, what form that's going to take, probably in July for that part. But as I said, if anybody has any ideas about, you know, Big, small, tiny, um, um, get in touch because uh, it would be nice to get some fresh ideas as well as the, the committee ideas. Okay, I'm sorry Jan isn't here and you're left with just me because it was going to be a nice balanced talk tonight. I was going to do the Middle Ages or the medieval time and Jan was going to do the modern time. But I suppose um, in some ways, looking on the bright side, what it does mean is that when we come back and do another another one, because Jan has done quite a lot of research into the lady she was going to talk about, we will put on another another evening and we can actually do more modern ladies. So it will be part one tonight and part two sometime next year. Not quite sure when. Hopefully by December, we will have our new program finalized and we'll, we'll be um, sending it out to people. Um, so, I'm going to talk about women of note in Auburn, the medieval era. I'm going to have to wear my glasses and make sure I press the right thing. Ah, okay. Why aren't you going to work? Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to look at two ladies who were both um, owned the manor of Auburn and they lived a nearly 100 years apart. You might have heard of Ella, who I've spelt her name wrong. How did I manage to spell Ella in the very first sentence? I've spelt her name wrong. It's one L. <laughs> anyway, Ella, Countess of Salisbury, who founded Laycock Abbey, and Alice de Lacey, who inherited the Manor of Auburn from her father in 1311, and whose life is said to epitomize that of a medieval widow. Ella's life shows how a medieval woman could negotiate the pitfalls surrounding women in this age. Alice's, how through no fault of her own, they could suffer from the inordinate power and aggression of those around them. So both had parents who tried to do their best for them. They um, sorted out some very influential men for them to marry. And both ladies were very brave and tenacious. Ella could be said to have led a very fulfilling life. However, Alice's was one of fear and heartache, but 
she did win through in the end and she survived. And I think a lot of credit needs to go to Alice for having such resilience. When we get to the end of the talk and you realize how many things she had to put up with and live through and bounce back from. Oh. Right. So let's start with Ella. I've got the name right now. Um, she was Countess of Salisbury from around 1187 to 1261. She was born in Amesbury, and she was the only child and heir of William Fitzpatrick, the second Earl of Salisbury, and Eleanor de Vitry. Her father had supported William I at the Battle of Hastings. Her grandfather had supported William I at the Battle of Hastings and had been rewarded with many estates. But he died in 1196, and when Ella was still a very small child, so she became Countess of Salisbury in her own right. And this is an expression you're going to hear throughout because both Ella and Alice inherited their land and their manners in their own right. And that was a, an interesting legal expression, he, it, which meant that although when they married, their land and their manners went to their husbands, it was still theirs through their maternal rights and shouldn't be taken away from them. And they could leave it to who they wanted to. Um, she was one of the most prized heiresses in England. And um, because of that, she was a good catch. And many people are gonna to want to marry her. Basically, they were after her money. And this was true of both Ella and Alice. A lot of their time, a lot of their life was spent trying to work out what was going to be best for them. And um, especially with Ella, she was very successful in deciding for herself what she was going to do with her life. Whereas Alice, I'm afraid, was rather pushed around by the men around her. So there is a story about Ella that to protect the young child from being married off by the king on her father's death, she was sent by her mother to be hidden among relatives in France. And the second part of this story goes, it's a very romantic story, that a young knight set out to find her and dressed as a traveling troubadour, he found her in a castle in France and brought the young girl back to England. Now, whether this is true or not, who knows, but it was written about in many um, um, kind of courtly writings of the time. Another story suggests that her uncle kidnapped her and hid her away so that he could grab her inheritance. Since she got engaged to her husband when she was very young, probably neither of these were really true, but this is a kind of, these are the stories that were often written about young girls at the time because they were so valuable. So her father died and Ella became the ward of Richard I. And he gave her in marriage to William Longsby, who was the legitimate son of Henry II and therefore the king's half brother. One interesting thing and actually quite nice thing about medieval kings, they actually quite like their Ill illegitimate children. <laughs> and they actually um, were very, if they turned out to be okay, they would promote them and take an interest in them. And these illegitimate sons were very, very supportive and loyal, usually to the king. And um, we saw that with Margaret, um, and who married M um, Matilda, Henry I's illegitimate daughter. And here we have it again, that William Longsby was looked after by the king, and also by his half-brother. On marrying Ella, William became the Earl of Salisbury and inherited all her lands. So he was very wealthy. She was apparently married to William when she was eight and William was 24. That didn't mean they had to live together or, you know, um, do anything else until she was probably about 14 or 15 and he would have been quite a lot older. But they appear to have been very happy together. They had eight or 10 children, sources vary. 
But of the eight that are really known about, there were four girls and four boys. They were both very religious. And together, each laid a foundation stone of the new Salisbury Cathedral. They did, they did a lot of um, religious works. They um, were very proud of their area. They loved Salisbury. They not only helped the church, the, the new cathedral and other churches around that area, but they put money and effort into making Salisbury a center of trade and wealth. So they had things in common. During one of William's long journeys abroad for the king, William was sent abroad a lot, and he did a lot of work on behalf of his half-brother. When it was feared he was lost, Ella refused to marry anyone else. She was approached and um, somebody asked for her hand in marriage, and she was very angry about this and appealed to the king and said, this shouldn't happen because I am still married. Some historians suggest she used the Magna Carta edict against a widow being forced to marry on the death of her husband in order to prevent her remarriage. And this is the little bit of the Magna Carta. No widow shall be forced to marry when she prefers to live without a husband. So, however, that she gives security not to marry without our consent if she holds from us or the consent of the Lord from whom she holds, if she hold from another. And by that, it means holding land. So if it was a knight directly under the king, um, she could apply to the king and not have to remarry. But if she did want to remarry, she had to get his permission. And if she held land from a minor lord, then she had to get that minor lord's consent to the marriage. But this should prevent widows from being forced to marry men they don't really want to. The Interestingly enough, um, as part of um, their role and um, William Longsby's role as sheriff of um, Salisbury, they actually were given a copy of the 2025 Magna Carta, which of course was different from the 2015 one. Um, because it, it, it built on it. 1215, sorry. What did I say? Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. um, and uh, it stayed at Laycock Abbey until it was moved to the British Museum in 1946. So I think Ella knew, the, knew about the Magna Carta and obviously, and I quite believe that she would have actually used that part of it to say, don't touch me, I'm not going to marry anybody because, and I have the right not to because of, of this particular charter. She was clever enough to do that. Um, she managed and used legal means to live the way she wanted to. Her belief in his return, William's return, was proved correct. He returned, but his health never recovered, and he died in 1226. And Ella had him buried in Salisbury Cathedral, and his tomb is still there. And, um, and there it is. And the little thing underneath that actually says it's the illegitimate son. Of, of the king, which is quite, quite interesting. There we go. So we have Ella. Um, she inherits her husband's land. She gets them back into her own hands, including the Manor of Allborn, which was not part of her original maternal uh, uh, um, legal lands because as we know from my last talk, Allborn was under the Counts of Pesh for many, many years until the Battle of Lincoln in 1217, when Thomas of Pesh, the last of the line of the first line of, 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 of Counts of Pesh, died fighting for the French. And William Marshall and William Longsby, who were in charge of the barons for King John, won the battle. And between them, they split up the lands of the Pesh and Longsby decided to take Allborn for his own, um, which um, he probably had a right to because he was related to Rotru of the Pesh by Rotru's second marriage to Hawiza of Salisbury, who was William's forebear. So at that point, 1217, 
we know definitely that Allborn comes in under the control of William Longsby and Ella Salisbury. Interestingly, William had actually supported the French at the beginning of their invasion, and he actually switched side to, sides to support John quite late on, which um, and he, but he does benefit a lot from the fact that he did that. So he was a clever guy. Okay, Ella founded two religious houses in William's memory and for the souls of her family. She was very family-minded, actually. One for men at Hinton Charter House and the other for women at Laycock. And you can look at the Abbey Charters for this. You can actually get them online, which is quite exciting. This is a, um, a kind of a rather stylized picture of Hinton Primary Chapel in Somerset, drawn by Samuel Hieronymus Grimm in 1790. It became a, a private house after when um, it was uh, the dissolution of the monasteries happened in Henry VIII's time. You can't go around it now, and it has been built up a lot, so it doesn't really look much like its medieval um, monastery would have done. There are a couple of rooms, apparently, which still look are, are genuine, are original. And the interesting story is, um, so we have one for men at Charterhouse and the other for the women at, Lay at Laycock, and both were founded in one day on the 16th of April, 1932, requiring a journey of 16 miles to travel between the two. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ella decided she was gonna do that and travel those miles to lay both foundation stones. The foundation stones may have been laid, but that doesn't mean that the Abbey took shape until about three years later. And here you've got a picture. I, I'm sure lots of you have been to Laycock Abbey. It's absolutely gorgeous. And the village is wonderful as well. And it's you, if you're interested in photography, you can go to the Fox Tormut Museum. Uh, and also, if you're interested in Harry Potter, a lot of Harry Potter was filmed there. But maybe that's not such a draw. But it is so beautiful. And these are the cloisters. Lovely. Um, now, a very interesting point came up. When I was looking at the original charters of Laycock Abbey, which you can get online, there is a gift given in 1230 by Constance de Liga in her widowhood for the souls of her father, others, of all of all her manner of woodsman's coat, woodsman's coat, to help establish the Abbey of Nuns in Laycock. And the interesting thing is that in the list of witnesses, we find Adam Vicar of Audibourne. So in 1230, we have a reference and a record of Allborn having a vicar called Adam. And I don't know any other reference to Allborn having a vicar that early or, or any history of the church that I've read, which mentions Adam Vicar of Audibourne. So I was very excited when I found that out. Um, I thought, wow, that's a little bit of original discovery that I've discovered. And uh, we ought to change the list of vicars now in the church <laughs> at the very top. Uh, do you know what, uh, Nigel, I hadn't thought of that. That's so right, Adam. Um, so when you start looking at these original documents, it is amazing what you can come up with. And the other thing I like, although this is not in the proper sequence um, uh, chronologically, I'm just going to put it in here because it was also in this charter that I read. Um, November 1378, letters of John of Gaunt, King of Castile and Leon, Duke of Lancaster, to Walter Hayward, his steward in Wiltshire. Whereas it was found by an inquisition taken at his manor of Baldbourne on the 18th of May last, and returned to his council at Gloucester on the 6th of November, that the abbess of Laycock and her predecessors have had four dozen conies a year by livery of the Warrener there, a gift of the Earl Warren, formerly Lord of the Manor, in compensation for damage done to the abbess's land adjoining the Warren. This livery is to continue. And this was taken at Gloucester on the 8th of November. And um, we know from talk, the talks and the displays that Alan Heisman has done that the conies were a very big part of the um, wealth, actually, of, of Allborn. And it's quite nice to see that, um, yes, um, Ella 
was not going to let anything damage her premises. And if somebody damaged them, she was going to get recompensed because she was that kind of a woman. And it was going to go on right through, you know, 50 years after she died, it was still going to happen. She, the, 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 the Laycock Abbey was still going to get recompense and get their, get their conies given to them. Okay. So on her husband's death, Ella inherited the role of sheriff of Wiltshire. Now, there were some other women who were sheriff of their counties, but not very many. And she held it for two years. That was an incredible thing for a woman to be doing at that time. And she was the only woman sheriff Wiltshire had until Lady Pawley in 1998. I don't know whether what that says about modern women and sheriffs, I don't know. Um, she, um, she had started Laycock Abbey and she had had a lot of work to do sorting out her husband's affairs when he died. She paid off his debts. She was responsible for liaising personally with the, um, the king and the king's accountants to make sure that everything was done right. She looked into his will. So she was very busy. And then I think she stood back and she thought, right, I've done all of this. Everything's now ship shape. My, my um, son has inherited most of my land. And what she really wanted to do was to join the nuns in Laycock Abbey, which she did in 1238. Some historians say she actually joined the Abbey in order to prevent the king from marrying her off and also to preserve her inheritance for her eldest son, because if she remarried, a lot of the inheritance would go to her new husband. And if she became a nun, um, she wouldn't have to marry. But it certainly agreed with her. I think she was a very good organizer. <laughs> in 1240, she became abbess and she held the post for 15 years. She stopped a little bit before her death because she was just tired. And eventually she died in 1261, age 75, a very good age at that time. She spent a lot of that those years making sure that Laycock was properly financially viable. If you read the charters over and over again, they are about the um, fact that um, Laycock, the village of Laycock was allowed to have a fair. She negotiated and got the rights to the fair for Laycock. She looked into um, making proper ponds so that there would be fish for the abbey to 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 eat, especially during Lent, of course, when they had to, they weren't allowed to eat, eat meat. She was absolutely tireless in working financially to make sure that both the village and her lovely um, abbey were going to be financially viable. She is buried at Laycock. She didn't want to be buried next to her husband in Salisbury Cathedral. And eventually um, her grave was moved a few times and it's now in the center of the cloister court. Which, which is pretty amazing, and it's still there after the, Re the Reformation. Um, and she's called often um, one of the two towering female figures of the mid-13th century. So a pretty impressive lady. And let's turn to Alice. And, and you can't see the top now, can we, very easily? She... Sorry? Try waving the mouse over the, the top. Right. Now come on. The mic on the On the other hand. Hmm? Yeah, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> what it says is she is Countess of Lincoln and Countess of Salisbury, fifth Countess of Salisbury, Suo, Suo Ure, again, in her own right. So she's got these lands in her own right. So Alice was born on Christmas Day, 1281. She was Ella's great great granddaughter, so the same la same line of Salisbury women. She was the only daughter and heir of Henry de Lacy, who was Earl of Lincoln, and Margaret Longsby. That's where her relationship to Ella comes from, who was Countess of Salisbury. She came from a line of very strong women. She had two brothers who should have inherited all these lands. Unfortunately, one fell down a well and died, and the other one fell off um, the walls of a castle somewhere and died. Two really freakish accidents. So she was left as sole heiress. In her 11th year, 
she was betrothed to Thomas of Lancaster, who was 14 years old, and he was the nephew of Edward I. Now, this was a brilliant mar marriage arranged by her parents, and King Edward I, and they married in 1294. So many similarities, aren't there, between Ella? Mm -hmm. But whereas Ella's marriage to William was happy, she had a fulfilling life, um, we're going to discover that Alice's did not go so well. Um, Henry, I mean, one of the things which people do stress is that her parents were very kind of um, ambitious for her. And that this marriage to Thomas of Lancaster, who was very closely related to the king, was possibly, there was a possibility that, I mean, Thomas might even become king one day. You never, you never know, because life in those days was quite precarious. So the kind of the thought is that maybe they were thinking that, well, well, maybe if Thomas becomes king, our daughter might become queen. So it was quite a, a coup to get her married to, to Thomas of Lancaster. Henry de Lacey um, releases all of his inheritance to the king. This is how things worked in those days. The king then released it back to him for the remainder of his life. And then when he died, it was all going to go to Thomas of Lancaster. This was part of the marriage settlement. There was a proviso that on Thomas's death, his lands would go to his brother if Alice didn't have any children. And that was quite extraordinary. So Alice's father was actually kind of signing away all of her inheritance. If they didn't have any children, it was all going to go to the house of Lancaster. And... Um, on this marriage, Thomas became ba basically the richest man in the kingdom after the king. <laughs> but he was overspending his income by 20%. I'd love to know how they found that out, but I did read that somewhere and I thought, yeah, he's that kind of a guy. He was extravagant. He was also said to have had to have all the faults of the Plantagenets being arrogant and prone to violent temper. And he was a bully. So whereas Ella really admired her husband, they got on well, they had the same interests, they did a lot together. Alice really does not like Thomas. I don't think Thomas much likes Alice either. I could imagine that Alice was quite a strong woman, having a lot of strong women in her family and also her father, who was a bit of a paragon, apparently, couldn't find anything that anybody wrote badly about him. So, you know, maybe he was a a role model that Thomas of Lancaster could never never match up to. Whatever. They really hated each other. <laughs> and after the first few months, she just lived away. Um, a lot of the time in one of her northern um, castles, um, Pembroke was the one that she really loved. And that's how kind of they got on together. They just kind of were married, but not married. They just went their own way. Thomas had several mistresses and several illegitimate children. And Alice just um, lived in her lovely kind of fairy castle. In 1311, her father dies and things get a little bit worse for Alice because she has nobody to protect her. While Henry de Lacey was alive, Thomas couldn't really do anything much about their situation. What we do know is from the Inquisition's post-mortem, which are mostly online and another amazing resource, you can read about what happens when some great knight dies. And this is from um, the Inquisition postmortem of Henry de Lacey when he died in 1311. Some of you might have seen this because it was put up in the Heritage Centre a few years ago. And this is a description of the extent of lands and tenements of which Henry de Lacey, late Earl of Lincoln, was seized on the day that he died in the county of Wilts, made at Marlborough, Marleberg, before the King's Escherta on this side of the Trent, the 24th of February, um, 1311. And then you have a list of witnesses, which I didn't put in, although they are some of them quite interesting, but anyway. So this is a description of Aldbourne. All the other places in Wiltshire and in the whole of England are also described, but this is the one for Aldbourne. The said Henry held the manor of Auburn by the law of King of England of the inheritance of Margaret. So it says absolutely that he's, he owns it because it came through his wife, formerly his wife. Now, Margaret actually died before 
um, Henry, and Henry had married again. So Alice had a stepmother at this time. Um, formerly his wife of the king in chief by night service, and it belongs to the earldom of Sarum, which of course is Salisbury. Oh, I can't read that top bit. Um, what can I do about that? There is one message with a... Okay, there is one message with a garden. A message is a big house. There is one message with a garden. And the easements of the other houses. So it's actually not just the house, but it's also the outbuildings and the land and the plot that goes with this big house. Which actually, I always think is quite interesting. Why do they just go on about this one house, this one message? Would there have been a big manor house at that time in 1311? Maybe there was, who knows? Which is worth per annum six shillings and a dovecot, which is worth per annum four shillings. There are 306 acres of arable land, which are worth per annum seven, 76 shillings and six pence. I love this. Price of the acre is threepence. Also, 80 acre, acres of meadow lying in Wanborough. And they belong to the said manor, which are worth per annum eight pounds. Price of the acre, two shillings. It's very factual, isn't it? I just love this. This is 1311. We know exactly kind of how much the lands cost, how much is in Allborn. And the other thing is, you've got meadows actually in Wanborough. We tend, we tend to think that a manor is kind of like a house, and um, that Allborn was just what it is today. But of course it wasn't. You could have had a manor with land scattered quite far away, but it would have been part of the actual holding of the lord of that manor. And it depended really on several things. It might depend on what the what the knight could could you know persuade the king to let him have. Um, so although you have the manor of Allborn, there are bits of, of it in Wanborough, there are bits in um in Chiseldon, there are all sorts of bits around which still belong to the manor of Allborn and add to its wealth, of course. There is there a several pasture for 24 oxen. That's quite a few oxen, which is worth per annum 16 shillings, price per head eightpence, and pasture for 500 sheep, which is worth per annum 41 shillings, price per head a penny. Um, 500 sheep, again, I think is quite a big herd to have had at that time. So let's go on. What's the top line, Cassie? Uh, there is one. One part. The, there, the, oh, it doesn't the, start there. There is one part, the profit thereof. Okay. Which is, I, honestly, what's going on here? There is one part, profit thereof is nothing on account of the wild beasts. So, what wild beasts would there have been around Auburn that you couldn't, didn't actually, it was value? If otherwise, it would be worth 20 shillings. So, do they mean perhaps wild pigs? Maybe boar? which would have made it very difficult for people to actually use it. And boar, wild boar were very dangerous, very dangerous. But there were certainly wild beasts around Auburn. Wolves, maybe, like 1311, perhaps? I don't know. There is, there is another foreign wood, which I presume is not in the middle of it, but around the outside of the village, of the area, which is worth per annum 20 shillings, also a windmill, which is worth per annum 20 shillings. And um, very interesting, All windmills were quite, the picture here is actually from the Netherlands. This is a real genuine medieval windmill, which is still in existence, but it's in the Netherlands. I couldn't find any medieval picture of medieval wind windmills from England. John, you've got a drink here. Um, and there is a field up the Marlborough Road, which is a windmill field. And I think that's possibly where the windmill would probably have been. Certainly not obviously in Windmill Close because that came a lot, lot, lot later. Um, but again, this must have been a really, really well-to-do village to have, have a windmill um, and one that was worth 20 shillings. On the sum of the issues of the manor, 17 pounds, four shillings and tuppence. So what about the people who live there then? There are there free tenants who pay per annum at the Nativity of the Lord, Easter, the Nativity of St. John the Baptist, and at the Feast of St. Michael, 
by equal portions, 23, shilli 23 pounds, four shillings and 11 pence halfpenny. Don't forget the halfpenny. There is a certain rent of four marks in Bredner, which I'm pretty sure is, is Baden, belonging to the said manor. And it ought to be paid at the same terms by equal portions, the sum 25 pounds, 18 shillings and threepence halfpenny. Free. Sorry? That's exactly free. It's just... Well, well, exactly. <laughs> but that's freer than the next lot. The next lot are 21 customers, and that's how it was spelt, actually, in the document. And these are people who held their land according to the customs of the manor where they live, and therefore they are customers. It has nothing to do with buying or selling. They sell that, they hold their land, and they have to keep to the customs of the manor. And some manors would have slightly different customs as well. Each of these holds one vergate of land, and they pay per annum at the said terms, 105 shillings. It's a lot of money. And their works are worth per annum, four pounds, five shillings and five pence. So not only do they have to pay rent, they also have to work for the, for the Lord of the Manor. Eight customers, each of whom holds half of their gate of land, and they pay per annum at the said terms, 24 shillings. And their works are worth per annum, 20 shillings and eight pence. All the said customers shall give to the Lord's larder 20 shillings at the Feast of St. Michael. I think this is kind of like the forerunner of the Harvest Festival, because St. Michael's feast would have been in the November time, and they had to contribute something um, to the Lord's larder. And I think that might have been because they would have had, you know, they would have had a big celebration at the end of the harvest. And... Um, so I think they would have had to contribute something to that. I think that's, for me, that's quite a nice idea, really. How large is a vergate? I think a vergate is one of those things which can vary slightly from manner to manner. Am I right, John? The better land vergate is smaller than the marginal land like on the downs. Because um, it, so, it, it it depends on how much how much produce you can make from the land. So if you know it will be like a, you know about forty about forty acres. Hmm. And the sum of the rent of the customers and of the value of their works is twelve pounds fifteen shillings and a penny. I've got the little pictures, which I haven't really spoken much about. Um, this one I quite like because it does show you, you know, it's obviously stylized and what have you, but a little bit of what a, a small kind of peasant type or tenant type house would have looked like at the time with the, the central fireplace, which stayed in most houses for a long time um, with the animals next door, with sleeping perhaps up a ladder, sleeping arrangements up a ladder, and the, your your goats and your geese and your pigs just around the house outside. Um, so, and there is also market on Thursday, which is worth per annum 26 shillings and eight pence. The pleas and perquisites of the court of the said manor are worth 40 shillings. Some of the value of the market and the prerequisites of the court, 66 shillings and eight pence. And the sum of the whole manor is worth 70 pounds, four shillings and tuppence eight me, which comes to about 50,000 pounds when I got one of these reckoners <laughs> to do the math mathematics, um, which was quite a lot. And when you think that they, they these kind of Alice and her family would have had, I don't know how many different manors, each bringing in a certain amount. Alborn was the most expensive, which the, the de Lacy's had in, in Wiltshire by quite a long way. Not most, but the most valuable. It, it produced, that gave the most money back, which was why it was so sought after. Um, and I've, some of the things which might have been sold at the market are, are there. Some of the goods which they would have produced at the time. And the interesting thing, of course, at the bottom, Alice, wife of Thomas de La of Lancaster, daughter of the said Henry and Margaret, is their next heir and is aged 24 years and more. 
So all of this went to Alice, but of course, what we do know is it didn't just go to her, it went to her to Thomas because they were married. Whether she liked it or not, Thomas got the lot. And um oh. The political background. We are talking about the political background. So you can't divorce Alice, poor lady, from what's going on politically. And it was a very turbulent time. Edward II seemed to have a, a penchant for getting himself into trouble. His first friend was Piers Gaveston, who you might have heard of, who was his childhood friend. Um, this is a 17th, uh, 1872 painting on the left by English artist Marcus Stone, showing Edward II cavorting with Gaveston while nobles look on with concern. And possibly the lady might be Isabella, his wife, because Edward was married to a daughter of the French king, Isabella, who was very beautiful and very fiery. And um, unfortunately, um, Edward really didn't understand why the barons hated it so much, but um, they wanted to basically wanted to get rid of Gaveston right from the beginning because um, he was very grabbing and Edward indulged him completely and utterly and basically gave him so much wealth and so much land um, that the barons were rather fed up. Um, I won't go into the how and why, but eventually Gaveston was caught and executed by the barons in 1311 after a mock trial in which he wasn't allowed to say anything in his defence. Um, and Thomas of Lancaster was instrumental in this execution. So he actually led the barons against Gaveston and got him caught and executed. And you can imagine that Edward wasn't very happy about this. Apart from being very sad, he really um, took against Thomas of Lancaster. <laughs> Big time. <laughs> and this is another picture which you can find. Um, this is the head of Piers Gaveston being presented to the Earl of Lancaster following his execution on Blacklow Hill near Kenilworth Castle as depicted in a 19th century illustration. They did like gruesome pictures, I can tell you. I had to, there were a few I decided not to use. Lancaster was supported by other barons in their dislike of the way Edward II had favorites. And even um, um, Lancaster's father-in-law before he died really tried and, and supported um, Thomas in his stance against Edward. Um, so it was it was something that needed to be done because Edward was not a good king, but unfortunately, Thomas didn't really know how to lead men properly. He fell out with the barons who who considered that he was a bully and um, motivated for power and not reform, which is what was needed. So unfortunately, although they beheaded Gaveston, nothing changed much. But let's go back to Ella, because in 1316, poor Ella, Alice, Alice thank you for that, um, had a very, very nasty experience. Um, she's basically abducted from her castle by John de Warren, Earl of Surrey, who is one of Edward's favorites. And there are many different stories about this abduction. Um, one of them, one of them, one of them says, "Well, she actually was implicit in this because she didn't want to stay married to Thomas." But it gets very um, murky because in one of the stories, um, the Earl of Surrey brings out this rather defigured kind of dwarfish type man who swears that he'd had knowledge of Alice before her marriage. You can imagine what Thomas thought of that. Thomas blamed the king. He thought maybe the king had was involved in this. Was Alice actually complicit in this abduction? And um, was the fact that the John Duke of um, John de Warren, the Duke of the Earl of Surrey, was the fact that he did the abduction because Thomas had had a falling out with um, Warren previously? Um, when um, John de Warren had wanted to divorce his wife. He didn't like his wife, he wanted to divorce her. He had a mistress with a few children and he applied to the king and appealed to the king. And um, Thomas was chancellor at the time and found a document which said that actually um, 
John de Warren had had a dispensation from the Pope in order to marry his wife, and therefore there was no way he was ever going to be given right to divorce her. And John had been the person who'd actually discovered this. So there was animosity between them, a lot of animosity. So poor Alice is basically being held by John de Warren, um, hoping that somebody would rescue her and explain everything. But what happens? Actually, not much. Thomas remon remonstrates with the king, um, but doesn't actually ask for his wife back. Um, and her reputation is pretty much shattered. The charters of the time and the writing at the time do seem to point the finger at her and blame her for this situation, which does seem grossly unfair. We don't know whether Thomas divorced her, but quite possibly because she'd been abducted and possibly raped. We don't know about the rape, possibly. Um, we don't know. Edward, in the meantime, has another favorite, which is Hugh the Dispenser. And here we have a picture of him wearing the three feathers in his hat, which denote, which are from the Prince of Wales. And people called him second king because he had so much power. And um, there were two kings in the kingdom. And um, dispensers were pretty horrible. I don't know if anyone heard about the dispensers. They feature in quite a lot of kind of books written at the time. Um, they were very grasping, very greedy and Edward just gave them whatever they liked. Unwisely, um, they turned Edward against his wife. They had, Isabel and Edward had had a few years of happy marriage between Gaveston and the dispensers, but now that was all gone. And Isabella was actually taken away from her children and told that she was not a fit mother. And um, yes, yeah, so Isabella is pretty angry at this point, which, You'll see what happens later. And again, Thomas stirs up the barons. He leads them, but he doesn't actually keep their loyalty for very long. And at the Battle, battle of Borough Bridge in 1322 on March 16th, which is our wedding anniversary, he gets captured. And guess who is given, guess who goes to take him captured to the castle of Pontefract is John de Warren who's one of his enemies. So that kind of gives you an idea of what Edward thought of Lancaster. That must have been a rather difficult journey, I think, for Thomas of Lancaster. You can almost feel sorry for him. Anyway, he's taken to Pontefract Castle, which is one of his own castles, and one where uh, um, Alice re really liked to live as well. And in a, a trial very similar to the one from Gaveston, he's, a, he's tried, it's a mock trial. He's not allowed to say anything in his defense, and he is condemned to death and executed. Interestingly, a few years after this, this kind of a cult springs up, which kind of favours Thomas and makes out that he was a martyr for liberty, that actually he did have good intentions and he did want reform and people should have listened to him. And there's even a petition um, made to actually ask the Pope to make him a saint, which is going a bit far. It, nothing happened about it. But it is always interesting in history to see that there are two sides to most stories. But that is a beautiful, beautiful castle. So, poor old Alice. Thomas is dead, executed. She and her stepmother, which sounds, seems grossly unfair, are both thrown into prison. March 1322. Alice probably thinks she was going to have the same fate as her husband. In one of the charters, she actually um, asks the king to give some uh, a church in Swayton to her monastery at Bering. Um, and the, the king agrees, but it doesn't actually happen for a long time. And the possibly the idea is that she thinks if I'm if I'm executed, maybe if I give some money to this monastery, they'll allow me to be buried there. And in fact, eventually when she dies, she is buried there. Um, she's only released until she promised to pay an indemnity of £20,000 to the Crown. Ridiculous amount of money. So in order to raise it, or even have any chance of raising it, basically she has to give up all of her inheritance from both her parents. 
and Edward gives her lands to his favourites. So you have Hugh the Dispenser, the elder and son. Hugh the Dispenser is now um, Earl of um, Winchester. John de Warren, Richard Fitzalan, Earl of Ar Arundel, and Robert de Ferris. Some of the land does go to Thomas's brother, as per the wedding uh, um, agreement, which we saw late before, and that's important. And eventually she is given her own manor to live in a small manor, and she's given enough means actually to continue some kind of life on her own, which isn't too bad. Um, huh, as soon as that's sorted out, um, the king sends a, 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 um, a posse of men to go and um, look after her because he is worried that um, she is going to, she's in harm, that there are men out there who wish her harm. Mm -hmm. So a posse of men come along and kind of virtually keep her under house arrest in one of her small manors in Lincolnshire. Well, luckily, the next news is good. Alice marries for love. So Ebulo Lestrange, brother of Roger Lestrange, Lord of, um, of Nicklin, who had been mentioned as an adherent of Thomas's in the Welsh marches, they get married. And it seems to have been a loving and happy union. Alice described in deeds as Ebulo's dear and loving companion. He never takes the title of Earl, which he could have, Euro um, Uxoris, as Alice's husband, by right of being married to Alice, who was a countess. He could have been called an Earl, but he decides not to. And again, um, some historians say this was because Alice didn't want him to. Even, even recently, Alice does have bad press. I don't know why. Um, it couldn't just be that Ebulo didn't particularly want to be an Earl. No, it has to be that Alice actually was controlling and um, because he was a minor knight, she didn't want him to become her equal. You can believe that if you want to. On the left, there is an interesting thing. Don't forget, when um, Alice um, was in prison, she had to give up all of her land. And what we have on the left is um, a legal document which actually shows that Alice has agreed to giving up her land to the, to, um, the dispensers. And um, Hugh, the dispenser, Earl of Winchester is the plaintiff against um, Ebels, which is um, Ebulo, Lestrange, and Alessia in Latin for Alice. And all of the manors there, including in the red square underneath, um, the Wapentake of, of Risley in County Derby, the Manor of Aldebourne, and one curate uh, carricate of land, 100 acres of meadow, 500 acres of wood, and four and a half knights fees in Wanborough, Perton, Benetham, Lutes Hill, Lutes Hull, Lunsdon, Wilton, and Shrivenham in County of Wilts, and several other places. So this is really kind of making it legal that the king's already done. And this happened quite often because they were actually sticklers for the law at this time. If the king did something, he, did, he didn't want somebody to come along afterwards and maybe Alice's husband to say, oh, actually you took away all that land for my wife, but now we're married, I want it back. So this is something which they had to go through whether they wanted, it or, well, wanted to or not, which actually said both of them agreed all of those lands were going to be taken away from them and given to the, whoever the king wanted to. And in this, at this particular one, it's going to be Hugh the Dispenser, Earl of Winchester. Um, clever. Okay, but the next um, political thing is that Isabella and, and um, her son go to France and um, meet up with Roger Mortimer, and they come back to England with some French, a uh, French army. They meet up with some barons and there is a bit of a civil war going on between um, Edward's wife and Roger Mortimer and some of his barons in order to get rid of the dispensers. And they capture the dispensers 
and they have the younger dispenser, the younger Hugh dispenser is executed in a very violent way. And there are pictures actually take, um, painted um, at the time, which are very nasty. Um, and she insisted on being present. She hated the dispenser so much that she insisted on actually witnessing this. And that was in 1326 on the 24th of November. Um, Hugh Dispenser's tomb is in Tewkesbury Abbey, and this is it. But they later they came along and took his the effigy effigy off it. Um, perhaps they decided that he was a bit too, a bit too um, a nasty to actually have his effigy in in the abbey. But they've still got his tomb. You'd think that hopefully Alice, this would be good for Alice because the dispensers have gone. Edward's in prison. But unfortunately, Roger Mortimer appears to be just as grabbing as Edward and the dispensers. However, in 1332, Alice and her husband pay William de Montacute, who is the new Earl of Salisbury, £200 for the return of Denby. Now, de Montacute has been made Earl of the reconstituted Earldom of Salisbury, and possibly um, Allborn would have come into his Earldom as well. And Alice and Ebulo keep a low profile and just try to keep out of the way until Edward III comes along and Ebulo supports him in his rebellion against his mother and Earl Mortimer. And actually, this is a good time for them. They actually have gained the king's support. Um, they regain a significant portion of Alice's estates probably only for life, but they still get them. They renounce the bulk of the earldoms of Lincoln and Salisbury, including Allborn, but they regained Bolingbroke and much of Pontefract in the north. They regained Blueith and a large number of smaller holdings in Wales. So life is good for the first time. You can say life is really good, but knowing Alice is never gonna stay good. And unfortunately in 1335, her husband dies. And um, she's one of his executors of his will, as uh, um, um, Ella was executor of, of her husband's will. And she gets him buried in her favorite monastery of Bering, where later she is also buried. Um, Edward III quickly orders a surrender of her lands to him, but she, he immediately gives them back to her. So she should be okay. She should be, she should be good. One of the first things she does is take a vow of chastity in front of the Bishop of Lincoln. This was to prove her devotion to her husband and also to try and show people he didn't really want to get married again. But unfortunately, it didn't work. And in March 1336, a royal official, Hugh de Fren, entered the castle of Bolingbroke and abducted her. Was he after her money or her lands? Was she complicit again? There are different stories attached to this. Alice apparently tried to escape, even falling off her horse at one point, but she's taken to Somerton Castle and raped by Hugh, and then goes to the Tower of London. Either she's sent there by Hugh or she's sent there by the King. We're not quite sure about that. So I've given a rather one-sided you know, picture of Alice as a victim of events and powerful men, but there are historians who suggest that actually Hugh and Alice planned the abduction because they wanted to get married. And they thought this is a way of going round the king and making him marry them, get them married. Because if you did rape somebody, you had to marry them. But a letter from the Tower of London actually shows that Alice really was very upset about the whole incident. And this petition appears to present Alice's true feelings, which express her dismay at being kept in close confinement by Hugh Dufresne, not allowed to see any of her family or her friends, and uh, sent from the Tower of London. You can see the Tower of London down here. A little side point is that she talks about Bolingbroke Castle, which um, went to her nephew-in-law, Henry, and from Henry to Blanche, um, and. Blanche becomes the um, wife of John of Gaunt and in Bolingbroke Castle, she gives birth to Henry IV in 1367. And that's the castle which um, was very, um, Alice spent a lot of her time and was very dear to her. So I'm conscious I need to crack on. Um, 
They had to marry because can canon law said if you rape somebody, you have to marry them whether you want to or not. Luckily, a year later, uh, Dufresne goes up to the Scottish borders and gets himself killed. And Alice is a widow again. <laughs> she immediately takes another vow of chastity and sets about looking after her estates. You'd think now she could enjoy a quiet life, but unfortunately not. Brother-in-law, and this is really sad, her brother-in-law, Ebulo's brother, Roger, who she knows and knew, and I think probably liked, demanded the right to some of her lands, even those which actually had come to his brother through, through Alice. And she spends a great deal of time negotiating with lawyers and um, King's um, employees to try and actually sort it out and keep some lands for herself. Roger and, Al and Alice's half-brother, probably the illegitimate son of Thomas of Lancaster, even invade her castle of Bolingbroke and steal goods and horses from. And then, I mean, okay, I think she does also have some fun time then. Just, just lastly, in 1348, she dies, which was the big plague year in, of, of that century. So probably she died of plague. But um, oh, I'm just gonna read another um, <laughs> in inquisition because this one is taken when John of de Warren dies. And I'm just gonna read the bit about Allborn because it's quite fun to compare the description of Allborn in 1311 to the description of Allborn in 1347 when John de Warren dies. In the manor of Aldeborn, there is a capital messuage with a garden worth three, three shillings and fourpence a year, which there was in 1311, a dovecot worth three shillings and fourpence, a windmill worth 20 shillings, two uh, carricates of land containing 200 acres, 100 acres of which are worth threepence an acre, the rest twopence an acre, 40 acres of meadow worth 12 pence an acre, 18 pounds of rents of a size payable as above, pleas and per perquisites of the courts are worth 40 shillings, and the profits of the conies between Michaelmas and Lent, 100 shillings. A much smaller account. Um, some things are still there, the windmill, the dovecot, the some of the houses. It doesn't tell us about the tenants, but um, it adds the conies. There might have been conies in 1311, uh, but there certainly were. It was a thriving industry in 1347. And um, the interesting thing is here at the end, it says the said Earl held the manors of, Tr of Tr Trowbridge, Amesbury, Winterbourne and Aldeborne and the hundreds of Amesbury and Aldbury by demise of Thomas, late Earl of Lancaster, under license from Edward II to hold for the whole of his life with reversion to the Earl of Lancaster and his heirs. The said manors and hundreds are held of the king in chief as parcel of the earldom of, Hen of Salisbury. Henry, now Earl of Lancaster, cousin of the same Thomas, late Earl of Lancaster, is next heir of the said Thomas and of full age. So this means that all these lands, when Thomas of Lancaster died, should have gone to his brother and then his brother's line. And this is written many times in the Inquisition's post-mortem. Um, and this is the premise which gives John of Gaunt power to say, actually, do you know what? Blanche, my wife, is a direct descendant of Thomas of Lancaster, and those lands should have come to me through my wife, and they haven't. They've been given to other people. And therefore, in 1365, he actually is about to petition the king and go to court to demand his lands back, but they actually settle out of court, and the Montacutes keep some of the land. Allborn comes to John of Gaunt, and that's how come John of Gaunt actually gets to possess Allborn um, in 1365. Mm. Through, through lovely um, Alice and all of her forebears. Um, so this may be an effigy of Alice in the church at Sweeton, um, which was granted to Bering Abbey. But so what's Alice's actual legacy? Was she um, a put upon medieval wife who suffered many much um, from the men around her? Was she a conniving minx who controlled everybody and got her own way? You can read uh, um, histories which say both. 
what she did show was the same resilience that Ella had. And in the fact, at the end of her life, she was happy doing good. She did lots of good works in the manors. There are many, many young girls in the north of England called Alice after her. Um, she endowed many religious houses and she was able to be buried in the monastery, her favorite monastery next to her, her husband. And I think those qualities that she shown she showed were the same as all the other ladies showed who were um, countesses of Salisbury. And I think they would have been proud of her. And she was definitely a survivor, I think. Right. Thank you very much. Yes. I do love, I do love medieval times. I'm, so, I'm sorry if I kind of, you kind of, you know, you're, too much information for overlap. Interesting. Um, thanks, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> any questions? Yeah, any questions for anybody? Um, I do love it that Liz, there's so much research on these things, and John does so much research on his thing. They can't talk for days on end. <laughs> <laughs> no, we email each other, actually. <laughs> He's no trouble. No, no, no. no. Uh, anyway, thanks ever so much for that, Liz. Uh, another chapter in the life of Warborn comes to light. Well, what, I need to go to Q now and look at the original documents. That's the next thing to do. <laughs> anyway, to um, I'll now hand over to John, who's yeah. got a very exciting uh, thing that's happened to us the last couple of weeks uh, come into our possession. And um, thank you, John, very much. Yes, well, I, I've stood in to cover up the 10 minutes or so that uh, Jan was going to take. Um, so I think that 10 minutes is really gone, so I shall be really quite quick. Um, let's see if I can. Now, very recently, we've come into some new documents um, that have been donated to our Heritage Centre. <laughs> They've come from somebody you all know, Millie Goddard. Um, she was asked um, a few weeks ago to go into the company that used to be their family solicitors to look at the documents in quite a large number of boxes which had been stored in their stores, uh, which the solicitors wanted to get rid of. So she went in intending to sort the documents into three piles, one pile of things that were important to the family and the family business, um, and that should be passed to their new solicitors. Uh, another pile of interesting historical documents that should be passed uh, to the record office at Chippenham, and uh, a pile of trivial documents that were of no real interest to anybody anymore uh, and should be binned. But amongst them, she found a small bundle of documents relating, not relating to the Goddard family, but relating to Aldborn. Mm. Um, and so she kept those to one side and offered them to us. And we said, thank you very much. Yes, we'd be very interested in those. Um, and I've, I've actually brought them along and they're on the table over there. And I'm going to just tell you very briefly uh, what they are. I've made an attempt, a first, run at uh, transcribing them to find out what they're about. Um, one of them in particular needs quite a lot more work because the scrawl that it's written in is dreadful. Um, so this will probably be a much um, more in involved talk later in next year. But just very briefly, um, the first uh, because I'm doing this to replace Jan, who's just told us that she's unable to, to be here tonight, um, I really haven't had time to prepare a PowerPoint or anything, so I'm just going through um, raw images. The first document is the large document that's on the table over there. And as it says on the... Uh, outside of the document, it's a counterpart lease uh, from 1827, 1829, um, between Thomas Coleman and Broom Wits. And it's a lease uh, for 14 years 
of um, Marianne, where are you? Your house and all its land and 40 acres somewhere else. Um, it, it's the lease for that land for 14 years from the Coleman family um, to uh, Broom Wits. It's a document in its own right. It's just that document there. The other documents all belong together. Uh, I, I'll actually show you that there is the document itself. Hang on. It's, there, it's, it's a very large document with an enormous amount of writing. The scribes were paid by the word, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, or either that or they had these very large pieces of paper which they had to fill up somehow. Um, so, uh, having transcribed it, um, the, the same sentence and the same phrases are used time after time after time through it. It's, it, it's really quite easy but tedious to do. But uh, there it is. Uh, you're welcome to go and look at it in a few moments. Um, the other documents are somewhat earlier. Um, and let's start with this one. And this has the title that tells us what it is at the beginning of the of the second document. And it says it's an abstract of Captain Hasden Young's title to the message with the appurtenances at Aldbourne in the county of Wilts, known by the sign of the Crown Inn. These are the title deeds uh, or at least an abstract of the title deeds to the Crown Inn. And these documents were all produced in 1748. In 1748, the owner of the Crown, who's this Captain Hasden Young, um, has decided to sell the property. And um, a lawyer, either his lawyer or uh, a prospective buyer's lawyer, has researched what the title is to the Crown Inn. And this is the abstract of the title. It's not the deeds themselves. It's a list of what the deeds are. And so it goes through and it's telling us the first date here is the 12th of January, 1703. Um, there's an indenture of release, uh, which means a sale. Um, I'm going to have to read my uh, uh, my transcription of it, but it's the sale of the Crown in um, from the Colmans to the Adams, who members of the Adams family, uh, not that Adams family, um, uh, and uh, a man called uh, Scory. Where is he? Richard Scory. Um, the, the Adams family. Uh, they were farmers of, at Ford Farm, um, and I've talked about them some years back in a, in a talk, um, particularly about Richard Adams, who ended up as a, 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 a merchant on the Barbary Coast in Santa Cruz, uh, what is now Agadir in, in Morocco. And that's where he was when he died. And I've talked about the difficulties they had of proving his will uh, back in England. Oh, sorry, my voice is going. Anyway, this document that we have there relates to, uh, starts at 1703 <clears throat> and follows each stage of the change of title of the Crown Inn from 1703 right the way through until, sorry, 14, uh, 1748. Um, one thing that's interesting here is er, in this early section, about 1743, 
Um, go away. Uh, it's very difficult when you haven't prepared a you know, PowerPoint. It, it tells us here that John Lydiard is the landlord of the Crown Inn um, and various other things about him. And in the margin here, somebody else has written um, that Lydiard um, leased the Crown from for a great many uh, for a great number of years before and after 1703. So now we have certainly an earlier date than we'd ever had before for when the Crown Inn was actually operating as an inn. Now we know that it was operating for, quote, many years before 1703. The earliest date that I'd found previously was 1712. Um, when it appears in a newspaper article reporting uh, an inquest that had happened, that had been carried out at, uh, at the Crown. So we've moved things back from 1712 to um, 1703 and a great many years before. Also, there is a smaller document, which also belongs with this group uh, that were all put together in 1748. Um, and I'll go back to this. Uh, it's not it. Well, it's... Sorry, I am. No, sorry, no, it's it is this one. It's this one. Um this one marked A starts. I can't see what the date is. We we can't actually see it over there because we've taken away the pin that was holding it together. But the year no way, I'm not interested in what what you are. I don't know who you are. Um up here is the date of the first um, change of title, uh, and it's dated 14 Jacobi. That means the 14th year of the reign of King James. And it's not James the anything, so it must be James the first. And that's 1616. So here we are, we're taking certainly the land that the crown is is built on um back to 1616 um so we've got to do quite a bit of work on these documents um to find out who all the people are who are mentioned and what it really is saying um but here here we are the 15th jacobi so it's 1617 um, Edward, Col uh, Edward Coleman, in consideration of a marriage to be had between John Coleman, the, uh, his son, and Dousabel Aldworth. Aldworth. So there's a great name, Dousabel. Um, and that's the, the building or the land is settled on John and Dousabel. Um, there in in 1617 and so it goes on really fascinating documents i will know a lot more about them by the time it comes around time to give a proper talk um and i'll be able to let you all know a lot more about those documents and what they really mean but we have certainly moved the history of the crown back a good many years with those documents um that's really all I have to say to, tonight. We'll talk about them more sometime next year. Thanks, John.